Selling your winners and buying your losers does not make any sense. Why would you want to sell down the parts of your portfolio that have been doing really well and instead buy back the parts that have been doing really badly? Surely that's the opposite of what we should be doing. But why then is this process practiced by portfolio managers all over the world? Well, in this video, I'm gonna tell you why. And I'm gonna show you why selling your winners and buying your losers can not only help you to manage risk, but also it can dramatically boost your returns. Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is James, and this is a place where you can learn everything you need to know to make better financial decisions. Over time, some parts of our portfolio are going to do better than others. And as time goes on, our portfolio is going to drift to become more concentrated around the areas that have done well recently. To prevent this drift occurring, portfolio managers will often sell down the parts of their portfolios that have been doing well to reinvest that money in areas that have been doing badly. But why would anybody want to sell down the parts of their portfolio that's doing well in favor of the parts that are doing badly? It doesn't make any sense. But is that really surprising? When it comes to investing, how often is it that we expect one thing to happen and then the exact opposite thing occurs? Well, that is definitely what is going on here because rebalancing is a process that is followed by pretty much every single portfolio manager across the world to help them manage risk, but also boost returns. So that you can understand exactly what's going on here and how implementing a strategy like this can help you, we're going to have to go back and look at some of the fundamental principles of investing and portfolio construction. These are really important lessons that you are going to need to learn if you are going to be building your own portfolios. But as usual, we're going to break it all down nice and slow so that you can understand exactly what's going on. Risk versus return is one of the fundamental principles of life. All animals, including ourselves, are programmed to only take risks if there is the potential for some reward at the end of it. A monkey will only climb a tall tree if it thinks there's a good chance of it finding some big tasty fruit at the top of it. But if that tree is too tall and dangerous, or the chances of finding fruit at the top of it are too low, well, it's not going to do it. And the same thing goes for us. Why do we put ourselves through the terror of job interviews or the awkwardness of dating where we risk being humiliated or rejected. We do it only because there's the potential for a big reward at the end of it. But if that reward wasn't big enough, then we wouldn't do it. Well, the same thing happens with investing. If you are going to risk your money, then you are going to want the chance of a return. And the higher risks that you're going to take, well, the higher return you're gonna need. And when it comes to investing, we judge the risk of an investment by how volatile and unpredictable its returns are, which is also known as its standard deviation. So if we were to invest in blue chip corporate bonds, we would expect a higher return than just keeping our money in cash. But if we were then to go on and invest in high risk bonds or stocks or property, we would expect a higher return again. And as you can see from this historical data, there is a very clear trend. Higher risk equals higher return. But the really important thing to remember is that more risk only equals more return if one, you're diversified and two, you're investing for a very long period of time. Because there will be many, many, many years, long periods of time where things like emerging markets will underperform US stocks, they'll underperform bonds, they'll underperform everything. But at the same time, there'll be times when US stocks underperform cash. So the more risk that you're taking, the more variable these returns are. But it starts to get really interesting when we start to mix all of these different asset classes together. So let's say we had a portfolio that was 50% stocks and 50% bonds. Now, don't fixate too much on the actual figures here because these are purely illustrative. But let's say that from our stock part of our portfolio, we expect an annualized return of 10% with a standard deviation or risk of 20%. Uh, whilst with bonds, we expect a 5% return with a 10% standard deviation. But what risk and return would we expect from the combined portfolio? Well, if it's 50-50, we'd probably expect a 7.5% return and a 15% standard deviation. 50% of the return from each and 50% of the risk. Well, this would be true if stocks and bonds were perfectly correlated, which means that they go up and down at the same time. Like in this example, where one asset goes up, the other goes up. 
and when it goes down the other goes down too and as you can see here if we had a 50 50 portfolio of these two perfectly correlated assets the overall portfolio would fit perfectly between the two with 50 percent of the return of each and 50 percent of the risk but stocks and bonds are not perfectly correlated instead they would look something like this where when one is going up the other is going down or doing nothing. Which means that when we combine these two assets into a portfolio, again, we're getting a return that is halfway between the two. But when we compare it with a black correlated portfolio, you can see that the white one has slightly less volatility. It's jumping around less. And because of this, a portfolio that holds both stocks and bonds will give us a slightly lower level of risk than any of the individual components on their own. And this is an example of this happening for real. These are the Vanguard Life Strategy Funds, which blend global stocks with bonds. Now, as before, the more risk we take, the higher return we expect to receive. And as you can see, that as we increase our equity exposure from 20%, which is E, all the way up to 100%, we do get a higher return. But these portfolios do not fit perfectly along a straight line, as you might expect if stocks and bonds were perfectly correlated. And as you blend more stocks and bonds together, you end up with the same return, but for a little less risk. And if we overlay these portfolios onto our prior charts, you can see that by combining different types of stocks and bonds into a portfolio, we get similar returns as other single asset classes, but for much less risk. So they're much more reliable. Now you will need to take these figures with a large pinch of salt because this Vanguard data only goes back over the last 10 years, whilst the individual asset class returns are over a much longer period. But it does still illustrate the power of diversification. This is a free lunch. There is no cost to doing this. And this is why this is a process that is practiced by portfolio managers all over the world. Although you need to be aware that as you start to construct higher and higher risk portfolios, they end up with diminishing returns because these portfolios tend to be more concentrated around a few riskier asset classes. And because of this, you can end up with portfolios that are you know, almost entirely comprised of emerging market stocks, which means that you're ultimately losing a lot of the benefits that come with diversification. And although a less diversified, higher risk portfolio may end up with better returns over the long, long term, it's likely to see long, long periods of underperformance. Just as you can see here, where over the last 10 years, emerging markets in blue have lost money whilst the rest of the world has been flying. If you have time to wait and you can stomach the violent swings, then there is absolutely nothing wrong with a high risk, high volatility portfolio. But if you're retired and needing an income from your portfolio, then this high volatility can be an absolute nightmare because if you start making withdrawals during one of the volatile downswings, this can have compounded negative effects on the survivability of your portfolio. So I hope you can now understand why diversification is so important. And it's also one of the main reasons why rebalancing is so important. Now, the Vanguard Life Strategy Funds that we looked at earlier rebalance their weightings to stocks and bonds daily. But what if you didn't rebalance? What if you started with a portfolio of 50% stocks and 50% bonds and then just let it drift over time? Well, if you did that, your portfolio would start to look like this example on the right. As stocks grow, your portfolio becomes more concentrated around them and ultimately becomes more and more risky. And we would expect that after about 30 years or so, you would end up with 90% stocks. Now, of course, and this is an important bit, a 90% stocks and bonds portfolio is almost always going to outperform a 50-50 portfolio over the long term. But it's taking a lot more risk. And the problem is that as stocks grow and the bull market gets towards the end, you end up taking a lot more risk just before a crash. So although rebalancing in this way does actually reduce our overall return compared with a buy and hold strategy, it does help us to keep a lid on the risk of our portfolio and ultimately gives us that downside protection. But rebalancing also brings us another benefit in that it forces us to buy low and sell high. Buy low, sell high. This is a 101 of investing, but it's something that we chimps find very hard to do. But rebalancing forces us to do this systematically without trying to second guess 
the market. Now there's lots of different strategies that you can use for rebalancing. You can either just do it based on a calendar, so either annually, monthly, or even daily, like the Vanguard Life Strategy Funds, although that's not probably very practical for you, or you can do it on a allocation drift. So if your portfolio was to drift by five, 10% from your desired allocation, you could then use that as a trigger to go and rebalance. To be honest, there's still a lot of debate about which of these strategies are the best. But as you can see here from this data from Northern Trust, with a 60-40 portfolio of stocks and bonds, however you choose to rebalance, you're getting a better risk adjusted return than with a standard buy and hold strategy. And that's because as a buy and hold strategy drifts, it takes on more risk, it loses diversification, and it doesn't benefit from this systematic buy low, sell high. It's much easier to get your head around rebalancing when we're just thinking about different asset classes. So with stocks and bonds, but what if you're a 100% equities investor? Does it still make sense to rebalance within the same asset class? Well, if you remember with the stocks and bonds portfolio, the benefits of diversification come from the fact that these two asset classes are not perfectly correlated. And as it happens, there are lots of different subclasses of stocks that are not perfectly correlated either. If we go back to our original graph and focus on this section here, you can see we've got US stocks and emerging market stocks. But within US stocks, there are lots of different categories. You have smaller companies and you have larger companies. And then within that, you have value stocks, which are stocks that look cheap compared with their fundamentals. And then you also have growth stocks, which are companies that look expensive. And as you can see, they have very different levels of risk and return. But what's more important is that these groups often see returns at different times. When growth stocks are doing well, value stocks tend to lag behind, as you can see here from this graph. Now, when the line starts going up, it means that growth stocks are outperforming. And as you can see, leading up to the 2000 crash, growth stocks were outperforming a lot. But when the line starts to come down, value starts to come in to favor. And as you can see, value outperformed for a very, very long period of time, pretty much up until 2007, where again, growth has outperformed. And the same thing goes for company size, where you can see here that there are clear periods of time where small or larger companies have done better. Typically, larger companies tend to do better at the end of market cycles, whereas smaller companies tend to do better at the beginning. But you also notice that I haven't included any sectors here or any countries. And that's because, especially when it comes to developed countries, stock markets are actually very correlated with each other. And the diversification benefits you get from including different countries is not as big as including diversification between these factors here. That's not to say that there are no benefits from diversifying across different countries. They're just not as strong as the benefits as you get from diversifying between things like company size and growth and value. But if we created a portfolio that was diversified between these factors, we would see the same level of weighted return as their individual counterparts, but for slightly less risk. And then when we rebalance, we're not only maintaining that diversification, but we're also systematically forcing ourselves to buy low and sell high as these different factors rotate between themselves. There is very little debate over the benefits of rebalancing. And most studies suggest that it can add between 0.5 and 1.5% every single year, which adds up a lot over time. And these benefits almost always outweigh the potential transaction costs and tax that you might have to pay from trading. But what does this mean for you? And how much should you be going out of your way to implement this in your portfolio? Well, if you're already using a one decision fund like a Vanguard Life Strategy Fund or a BlackRock Consensus Fund, then the vast majority of this rebalancing is already done for you. But if you're building your own portfolio, the simplest and arguably the most effective strategy is to rebalance once a year. However, you can certainly go down a rabbit hole with this stuff and there are many, many more advanced strategies and approaches for this. However, I would question whether it's really worth your time. And even so, the benefits of all these other strategies are still very debatable. So simply rebalancing once a year doesn't sound that much effort. It doesn't sound that hard to do. But the reality is that people rarely ever do it. But if you can do it, there are all these added benefits for very little amount of work. But what you may actually find harder 
is coming up with the best asset allocation in the first place. So that's what we're going to be looking at in my upcoming videos. I hope you enjoyed the video. It's now 20 past 12 at night and I'm going slowly mad. So I hope this all made sense. And if it doesn't, well, uh, I'll make another video next week. So I'll see you then. <laughs>